My name is Monk Rowe and we are in Manhattan. I'm very pleased to have bassist Buster Williams with me for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. Thank you for coming you. today. It looks like um, your group, Something More, has a couple busy months coming up. Oh, yeah, you've been to the website. Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I've been trying to um, to be really busy with that band since 1990. Mm -hmm. I did an album for a label, uh, in and out in and out Records, a label out of Germany. <clears throat> I did it in um, 1987, and it was released in Europe and Asia until 1995 when it was released here. But I did that album, and I wrote uh, the majority of the music for it. Herbie Hancock was on it, Wayne Shorter, uh, Al Foster, a trumpet player named Shunzo Ono. And um, after doing the, the, the album, six months later, I still liked it. You know? Yeah. I mean, you know how when you, you, you're working on something, you live with it so long. When it's done, it's done. It's like a, a release and a relief. Mm -hmm. And if you never hear it again, that's fine. But I liked it. And I said, well, maybe it's time now for me to put my own band together. You know, contrary to the way things are these days. Yeah. You know? You get a brand, brand new shiny horn, the first thing you think about is making a CD and putting a band together. You know, I mean, that's because that's the, the powers that be tell you that's what you're supposed to do. You know, when I came up, it was all about apprenticeship, which is a valuable commodity that's, that's being lost these days. But um, uh, anyway, that was the inspiration for me to put the band together, the fact that I still like the music and maybe I would enjoy a night's performance of playing my own music. Mm -hmm. I sure did have my own, what, what I, my, I consider to be my concept of what um, integral working unit should sound like. Also, you know, as Duke Ellington said, you know, the, one of the greatest reasons to have a band is so that you can hear your stuff, yeah. <laughs> you know. He certainly had that. <laughs> yeah. You, know? you get an idea, you write down some stuff, and you got somebody that will play it for you. Yeah, because it's a drag to have it all sitting around and uh, to have yeah. no idea what it sounds right. like. Anyway, that was my inspiration for the band. And, um, uh, and yes, we do have a few busy months coming up. But it's still not as busy as I want it to be. I want to be able to... to um, work the majority of the year with my band. Is it a problem when you get, you do so much work, um, do you think you have to stop taking some of the calls in order to make room for your own band? Well, it's a catch-22 situation, you know. You, now it's one thing to set aside some time and you've got, uh, you know, agents or whatever working for you, guaranteeing that you'll be able to work mm -hmm. this amount of time with your band. That's fine. And then, of course, you know, as soon as you decide to do that, you know, all kind of calls start coming in. When it rains, it pours. And um, so you want to hope that the things that you're turning down, you won't regret. And... Um, so that's, that's, that's one issue. The other is I do enjoy doing other things. Mm -hmm. And it keeps my perspective fresh. And um, um, it keeps me well-rounded. Now, not to say that, that spending the majority of the time working with my own project uh, wouldn't also give me that, you know, that diversity. And because, I mean, there's so many things that I want to do 
with my own project. There's many ideas that I'd like to have, I mean, I, that I'd like to fulfill that I can't fulfill if, you know, we got three weeks and the band gets to popping and then, you know, you got nothing for another three months. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, it's a weird situation, but um, I'm willing. I'm willing to, to uh, take the chance that if my band can work 360, 360 out of 365 days a year, great. Then uh, I think I can stay interested. I, I would think so. And then, you know, as far as turning down other things, I like to try and make room to do other things. I don't want to have to take what I don't want to do. At this point, I mean, you know, I've, I've been around a long time. You know, you want to think that you can pick and choose. Yeah. You know? The world gets in the way mm -hmm. many times. Well, you said you had an apprenticeship of about 30 years before you put your band together. As you mm -hmm. said, it's quite different these days mm -hmm. with them. Um, Young, it seems like the young musicians get pushed into that role. They get pushed away from where they need to be in order to establish something that's, that's long going. You know, in this business, the winner is the one who finishes last. You know? Explain, if you don't mind. Well, let's look at it. I mean, okay, look at Milt Hinton. Milt Hinton and I were <clears throat> on a... Uh, movie date we were doing for Spike Lee called Clockers. Now I've known Milt for a long time and uh, Milt was, this was about six years ago, six or seven years ago. So he was already up in years. Mm. And um, he had just done his first record as a leader. Yeah. All these years, I mean, playing with everybody, you know, Milton Berle, Bing Crosby, you know. And we were talking one day during the break, and he was, we were talking about all the attention that he was getting now. He says, where was everybody when I needed them? You know, <laughs> I could have used, used this 30 years ago. Yeah. So, you know, but, you know, that's what I'm talking about, you know, finishing. I mean, you stay around long enough, and it's all going to come to you just by, by virtue of the fact that you're still here. Yeah. What? You're still here? You survived. Well, you know, you deserve. Yeah. So, I mean, hopefully, you know, things change to the point where it doesn't get to that. I, I feel that, that people need to be honored while they're alive. Mm -hmm. If they're worth anything while they're dead, they must be worth something while they're alive. You know? Yeah. So um, that's what I mean by, you know, the winner finish is the one who finishes last. Yeah. The one who stays around. Right. You know, I mean, even in, in the society, you know, societies such as the Asian society in Japan, they know how to treat elderly people. When people become old, they don't throw them aside. I mean, there's a wisdom that they have now. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's an intelligence that they have now. There's a, you know, a, a, a wealth of experience that they have now that others can benefit from. You know the story of the, 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 the bull and the, the big bull and the little bull up on top of the hill? No. And, the, you know, and they're looking down into the, to the valley, and all of these cows are down there grazing, you know. And the little bull is all excited. <laughs> and, you know, he's just, he's filling his oats, you know. And he looks at the big bull and he says, why don't we run down there and make love to one of those cows? And the big bull looks at the little bull chewing his cud. And he says, why don't we walk down there? and make love to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. you only get that wisdom from experience. You got to live a, a little bit, yes. you know? So, uh, anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that was a good one. Um, do you think that jazz has, in the last, I don't know, about 20 years, really as an art form, mm. has been elevated in this country? You've got all these universities now, and you've got jazz at Lincoln Center and all the things. But what has happened to, as far as employment opportunities and day-to-day -day life of a jazz musician? It hasn't changed much. Um, in fact, um, in many ways, it's not as good as it used to be. Because I don't agree that jazz has been elevated. Oh. First of all, um, you know, it's, it's, I was looking at the... Uh, there's this tech station on TV that has 24 hours of modern technology, you know, all of the new stuff that's coming out with computers and, and how it's, uh, you know, used, being used in all of the different genres. And they now have a way of notating in the rap genre. They now have a way of notating, they got a music program that notates, um, um, what, what do you call it, the disc, you know, the, um, the record? The CDs? No, no, no you know, I'm like sorry. a scratch. You oh, know, oh, the, oh, they notate yeah. the And this music program will notate it, mm -hmm. you know? And everybody, many people are excited about it, except the, you know, the rap musicians, you know, they're excited about it. But um, the intellectuals are excited about it because now it seems to, to give some credence oh. to rap. And one guy says, as though the music has to be, you know, is, has to be uh, documented, mm -hmm. or now since you can put something on paper, then it's valid. Right. Well, you know, whether you like rap or not, that's, that's not the point. You know, the point is that... What validates this music is the allowance in society and by the powers that be to let the music flourish. And in many ways, that's being suppressed. You look at the, the, the festivals over the last 10 years, everything now has to have some kind of concept. Oh. And more and more, you look at festivals year in and year out, and everything is a tribute. The music of. Somebody. Yeah, the music of. Now, I never heard Louis Armstrong do a tribute to anybody. His great tribute was to carry the music on. When you listen to Louis Armstrong, you heard those mm -hmm. who preceded him. He didn't turn his back on the future and face the past to give validity to music. The, this, this music is only validified and, 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 and further advanced in its credibility by those who look forward and constantly advance the music, you know, and build on top of what has already happened. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that idea is being totally lost. Those who want to do that are having a hard time. Those who are willing to turn their back on the future and look in the past and do a tribute to this and a tribute to that, you know, and just step back in time, they are being accepted a lot more than mm -hmm. those who have a vision. Yeah. So in many ways, you know, the jazz, Lincoln, jazz at Lincoln Center has been a great deterrent to the development of this music. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and then, and then taking the, the young people now, I got, look, I got all, I, I love the fact that we have young people who want to play the music. When I started playing the music, I was a young person. I was 14 years old. So, and, and, and you know, you look at Kenny Dorham and his prime and Clifford Brown, and, you know, all of the great heroes, they all were, were young. But what was happening then was 
a uh, um, master disciple relationship that is as essential now as it was then, maybe even more so now, because we got to fight for it. You got to learn from those who who preceded you. You got to, and, and what a better what better way than to be amongst them? Mm -hmm. You know, you know someone. You know the days when kings walked the earth. You know, you wanted to come to New York because you know you and and you wanted to stand out on Fifty Second and and Broadway in hopes that one of your heroes would walk by. Uh -huh. And they did. And then you went running behind them. You didn't find out where they were playing and you went and you crawled through the window or whatever you had to do to get in and listen to them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in many ways, the, the music, you know, and you can't even say that it's more popular. Now, okay, it's being used to use jazz sells everything, yeah. you know, and you know there's always those who who want to be on in the in, so it's hip to to have some kind of knowledge or some kind of understanding of jazz now. Yes, it is. You know, Ken Burns now. Whew. What a great, what a great, um, uh, how can I say it? Uh, what a great service he did for us. Well, <laughs> what's the word when something is, you know, it's like this. It's like, you know, a service or disservice. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess it's your way of looking at it. You know, but it's very interesting that the top selling records of 2001 were Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington. Yep, the reissues. You know? Yeah. Now, what does that say? You know, we got, we got thousands. We got many great musicians out here who need somebody to buy their records. But the top selling records in jazz 2001 were Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. So now, what did Ken Burns do for the music? Right. Very controversial. Um, what's replaced that thing for young musicians where they would stand on 52nd Street and follow their heroes? There hasn't been too much, uh, there hasn't been a replacement. In fact, I teach at the new school. I've been there about six or seven years, I guess, maybe seven or eight years. And it's very interesting to see what happens semester after semester. The great thing about the new school at first, and probably still is, was the fact that young musicians from all over the world could focus on coming to New York where the music thrives, where the music is born, where the music is being developed constantly, and study at a university with these musicians who are active mm -hmm. in constantly redeveloping the music. You know, and then, but where do they go after school? Nowadays, you, you, you bring your students together and you find out that what they're doing after school is this guy over here, he and his, his friend have a studio where they got all of the latest, um, uh, you know, Pro Tools and whatever, <laughs> and they're actively involved in becoming producers <laughs> of new hip hoppers. Oh, no kidding. You know, and then this person over here, uh, you know, is, is carrying on a day job, a part-time job at a bakery or something, you know, and 
is looking for somewhere to go out and play his instrument. You know, and this person here um, has his own band, and he's working at the, you know, a night at the knitting factory or, or uh, uh, these little unknown clubs, you know. But none of them have anywhere to go where they can can sit for an evening but just paying five dollars such as you used to be able yeah. to do at Birdland, uh, the real Birdland, and sit there all evening and sip a, 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 a glass of beer in the, in the peanut gallery and nobody bothered you. And you could listen to two bands, Miles Davis's band and as soon as he finishes, here comes Sonny Rollins' band, <laughs> you know? Or you go down to the jazz gallery and you listen, and there's a John Coltrane with his famous band with with Elvin Jones and Jimmy Garrison, and and uh, uh, when they get off the bandstand, then there's Hard Silver. Those kind of things don't exist anymore, you know. So what you try and do is is make sure that all of your students have an opportunity to come here. Your band, yeah, my band. When I'm at, the, for ne like next week, I'm at the Vanguard. So all my students are going to come down to the Vanguard. They can hear the band. There was a, a little club for a while called Smalls. I don't know if it still exists, but um, night after night, all of the young guys and girls would crowd down there and hope to have a chance to play. Mm -hmm. There's a few places around the city, but it's not like it used to be. And now, I'm not crying for it to be like it used to be. Nothing is like it used to be. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the nature of things. Everything changes. It's, everything's in a constant state of flux, as it should be. But there should be some wisdom that's garnished and that's that's a, an, an accumulation of understanding how things go and how to make things better as we continue on. Mm -hmm. You know, for something as live, as, as alive as this music, it's like the proverbial roach, you can never destroy it. I don't okay. care how many roaches you step on, there's always going to be millions coming afterwards. This music will always exist, but only because of its own nature. It would be great if there was some support of the music through some kind of understanding of what it is that brought this music to us in the first place. Mm -hmm. And let's be the, per per uh, the perpetrators of those elements that allow the music to thrive and be the great cultural substance that it is. I mean, you take it out of the culture, I mean, it'd be, you know, where's, who's advocating a day without music? Right. One day with no music anywhere would be quite different. It'd be an eye opener. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about your process of gaining uh, wisdom. I, I understand you come from a two base family. Well, a one bass family. I mean, well, I'm the second bass. <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> my father, yeah, my father was a bass player. And uh, he was my teacher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have an early, what's your earliest recollection of your father playing gigs? My earliest recollection of my father playing the bass because when I was a little boy, mm -hmm. he used to sit on the sofa, sit on the sofa and put the bass between his legs and bow. He's, one of his favorites was Slam Stewart. Oh. And my father, and Slam Stewart always had this, he, he developed this great bowing style, singing mm -hmm. um, uh, the same phrases that he would play. And my father used to emulate that. 
And um, he, was, he was a great musician. He played piano and he also played drums. And uh, so he was always playing music around the house. There was records. His musicians would come over to the house and they'd rehearse. Once he had a, a duo, uh, uh, he and the piano player, they were working together as a duo. They play all these different gigs. They were called the Rollers. Kenny Andrews was his name. Kenny Andrews would come over and he and my father would, would practice and I'd sit there and I'd listen to him, you know, and they used to sing, mm -hmm. play and sing. And, and then um, when I was about 16 or 17, my father used to start taking me out on gigs with him. And he would play drums and I would play the bass. So that was my earliest recollection of, uh, uh, well, I mean, of course, when I was a kid, I'd see him leaving out on gigs. I used to run behind his car sometimes. He's, yeah. he's leaving out on the road, you know. Daddy, daddy, daddy. <laughs> I remember one time running behind his car. My father, I was heartbroken because he had to go away. But um, uh, so very early on, you know, I, what what kind of work was it? What kind of gigs was he playing, and that he would take you out on? Were they club dates and just dances, things like that? Club dates, dances, parties, everything. And were you playing jazz at that time? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, jazz in those days, I mean, was. Um, it it was it was accessible to everybody mm -hmm. and everybody loved it. I mean, it was it wasn't uh, pigeonholed, you know. I mean, we used to play straighten up and fly right, straighten up and fly right, straighten up and fly right. Cool down, Papa, don't you blow your top, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, on the breaks, my father used to spin his bass, you know, <laughs> and catch it back in time for the next downbeat, you know. But um, it was, uh, the music was intellectual. It was intellectual. But it wasn't, um, it didn't exclude anyone. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course, and, you know, the big bands were, were popping and thriving. And I mean, you went, you went to a dance and you went to, you, you, heard, you had a live band. Yeah. Used to be, you used to play a lot of cabarets. And people used to bring their own liquor and they have a table and, and they just order a setup. Remember cabarets? Well, not like that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it was, we used to have this big place in Philadelphia called the 7 Eleven. And it was a ballroom. And they'd have two bands. In fact, one of my first gigs was with the. Uh, uh, Jimmy Heath, at one of, we had a, at one of these cabarets. Jimmy Heath was one band, and Sam Weed was the other band. Uh, all Philadelphia musicians, and uh, you know, and you, you know, you, your reservation, you have a, you'd have your own table, and a big party of people come, you know, for your table. There's a big ballroom, and everybody, and you bring your own liquor. And what they would serve you there at the ballroom would be ginger ale, ice, you know, all of the things that you needed to go along oh, with your liquor. You and know? that was called the setup. That was the yeah, setup, yeah. you know, potato chips and all that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And the cabarets happened every weekend. So I played a lot of those kind of things. Was your father in favor of you? I mean, you rapidly got into the business by the time you were 16, 17, and 18, and you mm. started going out, did he feel okay about that, and your mother? Well, he was a little more accepting of it than my mother was. Yeah. You know, my mother said, oh my goodness, another musician. You know, <laughs> and, he's, and then when I started traveling, you know, it was like, 
she said to me one day, she says, if I knew that this is what I had to expect when I first let you go out on your first gig, I would have never had done it. <laughs> you know, when I started traveling all over the world and stuff. And, you know, um, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a hard life on those who, who, who love you, you know. Uh, it's a hard life anyway, but you don't look at it that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, to the day, I, I still love to travel. And my happiest time is on the bandstand, you know. I don't want too much time between one gig and the next. So, but uh, my, my father, now, you know, the first time I went out on the road was with Gene, Gene Ammons and Sonny Stitt. Mm -hmm. And the gig started on a Friday night. Nelson Boyd, remember the bass player Nelson Boyd? Uh, Dizzy Gillespie wrote the tune Half Nelson for Oh, him. okay. No, I mean uh, Charlie I'll... Parker. I think okay. Bird wrote the song. Half Nelson, he wrote that for, for Nelson Board. Nelson Board was a good friend of the family's. He and my father were close buddies. Mm -hmm. Nelson was working at the showboat in Philadelphia with Gene Ammons and Sonny Stitt. The gig had started on Tuesday. He couldn't make the gig Friday and Saturday. And so he asked my father to do it. And my father was working, so my father sent me. And um, that was my first really big gig. I guess I was, I was 16. I was close to 17, because I was almost ready to graduate from high school. In fact, I was 17 because I think school had been out for about a week. Mm -hmm. And um, I went over to the showboat, and after the first set, Gene Amos and Sonny Stitt took me aside and started calling me Junior. I was, they, was, they were like my two daddies. Yeah. And um, asked me to stay with the band. So this was Friday, Saturday night after the gig, I went back to Camden to pack my bag and come back over to Philadelphia to meet everybody. We were leaving out for Chicago about four in the morning. And um, my father and my mother uh, helped me pack my bag. My father gave me his, one of his, his suitcase. Looked like a checkerboard, one of those <laughs> checkerboard suitcases with, with the strap went around the, the center of it, you know? Yeah. And my father told me all of the things to look out for on the road. How to act like I was smoking reefer and not really be smoking reefer. How to always keep my bus fare home. All of these things he, he told me about. Everything he told me about, I ran into. And uh, he, was, he was like that. He, he was prepared for me to become a musician. Mm -hmm. And he prepared me to become a musician. My, father, my mother, you know, I know her heart was pounding. You know, just her little baby getting ready to you know, go out. I had never been away from home. Mm -hmm. I mean, for any length of time. So um, he was more prepared for it than she was, you know. And then um, um, he passed away. This was in 1960 when I went out on the road. Then in 1965, he passed away. But by that time, I had been with, with Gene Amos and Sonny Stitt. I was with Sarah Vaughn. I had been with Dakota Staten, and I was with Nancy Wilson. Mm. And... Um, he had, he had seen, you know, things start to happen for me. I, I had made many records by that time. Yeah. And uh, he, was, he was proud. He was, was proud, you know. But he was able to, to pass away while on the bandstand. I mean, while on the gig. Wow. 
It was right after the gig one night. He, he was a, up in Schenectady, New York. Where, by the way, um, uh, his favorite bassist, um, Slam. Slam Stewart, uh, lived or was born. I think it was Schenectady, New York, wasn't it? Binghamton, I think. Binghamton, that's where he was. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Now I see when you're doing Slam Stewart, you're doing the uh, the German bow. Is yeah, that what they call it? Yeah, that's yeah. what my father taught me. Yeah. The German bow. Mm -hmm. we'll see. That's great that he was able to see your success well underway. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Well, you worked with a great list of singers. You learn anything different from singers than you do from playing behind horn players. Uh, I think that there's a wealth of knowledge that you learn from singers that you don't learn from horn players. Or it's not as pronounced. See, with singers, you learn right away that you've got to play in tune. Not because they necessarily sing in tune. <laughs> you know? But in my case, I spent two years with Sarah Vaughan. Sarah Vaughan not only sang in tune all the time, but she had perfect pitch. So she knew when you were out of tune. And now the, the antithesis to that was when I worked with Betty Carter, who always sang out of tune. But you still better play in tune. <laughs> there was, you know, and out of tune did not affect her effectiveness. It was sort of like an art form for her. <laughs> but with, 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 with Betty Carter, she was the consummate canned heat. She was like a, like a can of sterno. Mm. And you open it up and you put a flame to it and you get this beautiful blue flame she could swing slower than anybody I had ever played with. She could sing a ballad, or she could, she could count off a tempo that was just perfect for the tune that you're gonna play. Mm -hmm. She could lay back so far, you know, you'd be, all, you'd be <laughs> damn near half a course ahead of her, and she's still singing in the right place. Wow, that's amazing. You ever tempted, I mean, the first few times that happens, are you ever tempted to like, oh, she's be should I go with you her? You get scared to death, <laughs> man, because, you know, it, what, what happens for the first time, you're on your own. You know, there's many, there's many revealing moments in playing this music and in your development. And in, 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 in talking about uh, Betty Carter, she would be so far behind that if you listen to her and not, you know, you, you, so you're listening to her and you're listening to the piano player and you know that they're in two different places. But you, and you got to be with the piano player. You got to be, because she knows what she's doing. Mm -hmm. And you cannot skip a beat and you can't, you know, fall behind to try and... No, no, she knows exactly what she's doing. She wants you to be where you're supposed to be so that she can be where she is. Yeah. So that's, that was a revealing moment, you know? And in, and, and in order for it to work, you have to do exactly what you, you're supposed to do. When the, that, that, that week that I started with Gene Ammons and Sonny Stitt, um, we were playing Savoy. We play it fast. And I'm watching the drummer's sock cymbal, you know, to help me keep the time. So Sonny Stitt sees me doing this. So he goes and stands in front of the sock cymbal and looks me dead in the eye with a frown on his face. Stands in front of the sock cymbal so I can't see it. 
and any and any words his lips he moves his lips to say listen don't look listen revealing moment mm -hmm. you know so yeah but um uh, you know you, you, you this music makes you fearless Fearless. Fearless. Yeah. And, and the quicker you become fearless, the easier it's going to be for you. And, and that's a realization. When, ah, oh, i got to be like a lion. I have to fear nothing. Because what else is going to allow you, first of all, to, to attempt to play something different? Mm -hmm. And the 32nd chorus of this song, <laughs> you know, after you've been playing behind yeah. every soloist, you know, you can't walk the same thing. You can't play the same notes all the time. Mm -hmm. You got to be fearless. You got to step out. You got to step into to, to places that you've never been before. That's a great statement. And I, I wonder if the way you sound and play comes out of that. Because when I listen to you, I hear a lot more stepping out than I do from some people. With your glissandos, I guess I'd call it, and sometimes um, not constant walk, but loping from one thing to the next. It's hard to describe, mm -hmm. but you have a sound that no one else has. And I was going to ask you, I might as well ask you now, do you know where your concept of a sound came from? My concept of a sound came from my father. Because my father told me early on that that was what I had to go for. And see, in the days when I came up, sound was everything. You know, you listened to Coleman Hawkins. And you knew Coleman Hawkins as soon as he played one, one note. And you knew it wasn't Ben Webster because nobody else sounded like Ben Webster. And nobody sounded like Coleman Hawkins. And nobody sounded like Prez. And nobody sounded like Bird. And nobody sounded like Miles. Miles was, was, was wise enough to early on realize that going, going after playing like this wasn't going to be his, his claim mm -hmm. to fame. Everybody had their own sound. Even piano players had their own sound. Hard Silver sound totally different from Oscar Peterson, who sound totally different from Art Tatum, who sound totally different from, from uh, Fats Waller, who sound totally different from Phineas Newborn. All these guys, sound was the thing. To the day, nobody has ever been able to copy the sound of Art Blakey on the drums. The way Art Blakey plays the drums, the way uh, uh, Elvin Jones played the drums, the way Philly Joe Jones played the drums, the way Art Taylor played the drums. Everybody had their own sound. Sound was the thing. Nowadays, it's, it's the age of, this is the age of mediocrity. So many people are going after the wrong thing. Drummers first, you know, are trying to learn a bunch of stuff on the snare drum rather than how to get a sound on the, on the ride cymbal. They don't realize the great value of a Ben Riley. How to ride, how to make a, how to ride, how to, how to make a gig with nothing but the ride cymbal. <laughs> Billy Higgins. Mm. Billy Higgins made a gig one time. The drum showed up late, so he took a chair. He had his cymbals, so he took a chair, and he played, played the chair and his cymbal. Oh. And when the drums came, he was swinging so hard, nobody wanted him to set up the drums. He played the whole gig with a, with a, with a wooden chair and a, and a ride cymbal. Oh. Papa Joe Jones used to come to Bradley's. Remember Bradley's? We had, Bradley's was the... Was, is the infamous after hours place mm. for New York for duos, piano and bass. Papa Jones used to come to Bradley's 
with his brushes and his newspaper under his arm. And he'd sit at the bar in front of the piano player and drummer and take his newspaper and fold it up, you know, fold it up New York Times and take his brushes and sit there and play brushes on the newspaper and swing to the cows come home. You know? I mean, this, that was the climate. That was, I mean, that was the, you, 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 you came from, from, from the place of creativity in the days when, 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 when I was learning how to play this mm -hmm. music. So when you talk about my sound, it's not, it's, it, it, I, I worked on it. That's what I went after. Uh -huh. My father told me, when I started working with all of these different singers, you know, and one night I was talking to my father and, you know, complaining about the fact that, you know, all these, these singers, you know, you're playing the same thing over and over again. He said, any time that you're able to have your instrument in your hand is a moment of revelry. And he said, if your responsibility tonight is, no, is, is to do nothing but play one whole note C, play it better tonight than you played it last night with the resolve that you'll play it better tomorrow than you play it tonight. Mm. And he used to make me, he, he would have me, he would have no, he would allow no slack in my left hand. When my hands would hurt, when my fingers would be sore, and the, the, you know, the muscles in here just feel like they're going to pop. Mm. He told me that the sound was coming from my left hand, and he, and, and, and he was very strict about my left hand being correct at all times, never relaxing it. So when you talk about my sound, it's... That's something that has been my predominant goal. Mm -hmm. Well, it worked <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I mean, some of the the albums that I have of you, you're on uh, with Joe Farrell and uh, those CTI. Outback. Yeah, I mean, a boom. you got this thing happening. It's just so great. I mean, congratulations, I guess is all I can say. It's, well, thank it's, you. It's great. Great. Um, do you have a discography of all the things you've played on over the years? You know, uh, at my website, if you go to my recording page, mm. there's a discography there. You can click on it, and it yeah, it stretches out for days. It's pretty long. <laughs> and. Uh, it's partial at best. Yeah. Um, I've been very fortunate to play on a lot of records. and um, I don't know how many, the, the, I don't know. I think when I, I think when that discography was put together, we found something like um, 400 albums, but that's almost 10, 15 years old now. Oh. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot. Yeah. You said something that I really found interesting early on, um, that referring to your, your own album you did that became something more... Mm. that you continued to like it, mm. you know. Could you pick out uh, what would be 10 albums that you would continue to like from your discography? Of mine? Yeah. Well, I mean, of anybody you've played uh, with. Okay. Harold Land, A New Shade of Blue. Ooh, I have it next door. You have to sign it. <laughs> That's one of my favorite albums. Me too. Um, uh... Mine, that's something more. 
In fact, I seem to like all my CDs now that I do. That's good. I'm glad. And I've been very fortunate. I, I, I can, I've been able to put out at least one or two a year. Mm -hmm. um, after that dry period between 1987 and 1996. But since 1996, I've been, it's got new product coming out all the time. Uh, new Shade of Blue, um, something more. Um, uh, those Sphere albums. With uh, Charlie Rouse? With Charlie Rouse. And, yeah. Charlie Rouse and Kenny Barron and mm -hmm. Ben Riley. Uh, oh, I don't know. How about something with Herbie? Anything in particular? Um, yeah, the um, M1 Uh huh. M1 Dishi. That was a good one. I think what we we did about five or six yeah. or something. That's some nice writing on those things. Mm, yeah. Oh yeah, the Prisoner. Oh, Herbie did some of his best writing on that. Man, you know, some of the best records have been made in six hours. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you had a rehearsal the day before, that was a luxury. Yeah. Most of the time, there wasn't. You went over to Rudy Van Gelder's, mm -hmm. and you set up, and you, you, you started playing. Maybe the, the, you know, you do two, three takes, you know, but I mean, you know, the first take, if, it do, if the first take is not the take, well, then that was a perfect rehearsal. Mm. You know? It's <laughs> a good way to put it. So, you know, you don't, you, 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 you got to, and that's another thing that, that, that kids are, is, you know, not understanding these days. You got to make every moment count, you know? When you go to these record dates, now it's different when you, you know, you're going and you, you, all of these are your friends and all, you know, and you all came together because I love the way you play, you love the way I play, you know, but then, you know, what about when you get called for one of the dates, you know, and um, it's, a, it's a record date, which is, you know, I mean, there was a time when this happened every day, all day long. You got about three or four dates a day. And you're going from one to the other, and you never played any of this music. You know? And you're there with people of varying degrees of ability in reading music. You know? But you better bet that, each, that all of these people can read music. Right? Mm -hmm. So you got to read music, too. But maybe you're not as fast as this guy over here, you know? But when you get into the studio and you set up, you know, there's all kind of technical problems that are going to happen. You've got to know how to use every moment to get your stuff together, uh -huh. you know? And you look, uh, there's a passage in the music that you're not too clear about. You've got to know how to listen to what's going on to answer your questions, you know, because ain't nobody, you know, nobody has any time to teach you. Like my father told me one time we were on the bandstand and in between tunes, I'm sort of like practicing and my father took his sticks, he's playing the drums and hit my strings. He said, no practicing on the bandstand. He says, either you ready or you're not. Uh -huh. So when you're walking in, you got to be ready. Yeah. And you got to know how to use opportunities that are occurring all the time to help you to be ready. So that when it comes time to really go, okay, everybody's ready, all the technical problems are, play, are solved. Now, you don't want to be the one to, <laughs> that ruins the take. Take two. Right? Yeah, right. So now you've taken all this time when everybody else had to stop, you know, they had to stop for all these other things. You're getting your stuff together. So now you, you, play, you play the music and, wow, you're going to get called back again because you played the hell out of it. Because you knew how to use, you know? 
And the problems that you had here this time, you won't have next time. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, especially important, uh, you've done your share of commercials and movie scores. Mm -hmm. Time is money, right? Time is money. When I uh, first moved out to California, and then uh, Ray Brown left uh, Oscar Peterson, and he came to California. Then Ray Brown and I became very close, and I became his number one sub. And he would send me on anything and everything. One time I had to go out to Universal Studios to do McKenna's Gold with Gregory Peck. And I was the principal base, principal basis. We had eight bases. Right? So Ray couldn't make it, and he was the, he was the principal basis, so now wow, you I'm the principal me. basis. I said, Ray, <laughs> what do you want me to do? He said, go on out there and take charge. You know? He, he, any doubt that I had, he never had. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, you know, I'm the one determining, you know, when is down bow, when is up bow. Yeah. Yeah. But you know this. You 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 know you learn how to adapt mm -hmm. real quick. You know, and on these dates here, you know, if it's not done today, it won't be done. You don't have, you know, uh, two or three days, much less two or three months, mm -hmm. to do this record. <laughs> you know, we're gonna make this record by dinner time. We're going to start at 11 o'clock in the morning, and we're going to be finished by 6. Man. <laughs> it seems like, it seems high pressure. Yeah, but you know, it's very interesting. In those days also, on the bandstand, a gig consisted of five sets a night. Mm -hmm. In many situations, it was 40 on, 20 off. And you played five sets, you know? And it was nothing to finish 3 o'clock in the morning. Nowadays, we're spoiled. We don't want to play more than two sets. Yeah. You've got to play a third set on Saturday night. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know? Right. You know, got used to being finished work by 1 o'clock, getting mm -hmm. home in time to, to, you know, to see Cheers on TV. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Now, if I was to come to Village Vanguard when your group is playing there, will I hear two sets? Is that two the, sets? But they're they're fairly long sets, right? Yeah, you know, um, about um, seventy minutes. Yeah, and do they um, turn the audience over for those things? Hopefully. Yeah. If there's some people waiting, if there's enough people waiting outside. I see. Okay. You know the. The thing that you hear too often is, uh, uh, you know, after you finish playing the set and the, the guy off the stage, you know, is making his announcement, saying, you're all invited to the second, <laughs> oh. the second set uh, for just a, a, a $10 minimum. I see. You know, that means that, you know, there's not enough people to put you all out I and see. fill up the room again. Uh -huh. It's nice when... Uh, you know, when you when you have to, after you finish your first set, thank everyone for coming, and please come back again. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh, that's so nice, because you got, you know, you got a new set of people to come in. You're going to turn over the house. Yeah. With the, the small number of clubs of, of stature, like the Vanguard and uh, Blue Note, is it hard to get your own group in there? I mean, what do you have to do to get on the schedule? Well, man, these people are receiving tapes and press kits and requests every day. It's a buyer's market now. Yeah. You know? There's more bands than there are places to work. And then... Um, what is what is fading out, but what was the predominant determining factor over the last 10 years was 
these record companies uh, getting their new artists into these clubs and their new artists, it, it, the club being able to pay for it because the new artists, is, they're not charging that much. Plus, the record company is buying, you know, 500 seats for the week. So then the club owner, you know, it's, it's, you know, he or she has to do nothing. Yeah. I'm going to have, you know, this person here in my club who's getting, who's getting fresh ink. This is the person that's, getting, that's being written about. This is the person that's being nominated for the Grammy. This is the person that this record company is pushing. Right? And the record company has bought 500 seats for the week. Which means, all, you know, they're going to fill them up with record execs. And, yeah. You know, but the club owners got warm bodies in the seats. And that's the bottom line for them. That's all they care about. Yeah. So, but then that's not happening, in, you know. So, so then established artists who have the, the, the track record and, the, um, and all of the... the credentials may not get the gig mm -hmm. may not get the gig because this is not the person who they put on the cover of jazz times yeah. this month <laughs> you know oh yeah we know of, oh, we know of him oh yeah he's great yeah you know but then there's this this new little shiny guy you know that everybody's talking about right now yeah so, you know, and, and so, and, and there's this one club for all of these different variables. Yeah. So, you can see the situation. Yeah. Let me just ask you briefly about your uh, compositions. Do you write at the piano? Do you start from your bass? Or how does a tune start for you? It may come from anywhere. It may, it may start on a piano. It may start on a bass. It may start in a dream. Hmm. Um, <laughs> but someone said something very interesting. And that was, as far as composing, try not to compose from the piano. Because you stand a chance of being limited by your ability to play the uh -huh. piano. So, <clears throat> but nevertheless, um, an idea can come from wherever. Uh, one, of my, one of my most liked tunes, it seems, is Christina. And Christina came from, from a re request from my sister to write a song for her newborn daughter. No. So, so the song was inspired by, by this little girl's vibe, persona, uh -huh. whatever. And uh, it's, it turns out that it's one that works real well. But, um, yeah, the, 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 it can come from... But I, 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 at some point, I got to sit down at the piano. You know, yeah, and figure it out. You know, it's not it's not important for me to be able to play it. It's, you know, it's important for me to be be able to write it, and then I can get the get the piano. Player yeah, right. <laughs> to play it. It'll do slightly better. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Is anybody that you're aware of writing? Uh, hopefully, it's you. Maybe what will become the standards? I hope it's, I hope it's me. Yeah, and that'd be great. Be nice. Yeah, you know, uh, a friend of mine. We were just talking about that the other day. One of the things that um, that Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter and Ron Carter. It's interesting, you know, when you talk about Herbie and Wayne and Ron, you know, you don't have to use their last names. Everybody knows yeah. who's talking yeah. about. One of the things that, that, that 
perpetrated their music was the fact that they played each other's music. And, um, and that's sort of the, the kind of thing that, that, you know, Bird and Monk and Miles and Dizzy, they did also. They mm -hmm. played each other's music, which is what we need to do more of. We need to play more of our contemporaries' music. And that makes, helps make the music standard. A lot of the standards from that, that we call standards now came from plays or came from movies. Yeah. But a standard is never a standard if it's only played once. It's got to be played over and over again in different kind of situations. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it a standard. And, um, um, I mean, I'd like to see more of, of our music, you know, meaning the, 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 the jazz compositions becoming standard material. And I guess what helps is, is the kind of um, genres that it's played in the kind of situations yeah. that the music is used for. I think it helps, too, if there's a lyric. You it know, always helps if there's a lyric. Yeah. People can put yeah. the lyric in their head as you're playing it. You know. People like to sing these songs that they like, you right. know? Yeah. I'm, getting, I'm doing a project for this summer. I'm going out with um, a singer. Uh, named Melissa Walker. You know Melissa Walker? No. She's a very good singer. And uh, she, she wants me to write music that fits her in, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, a couple years back, I did a project for a Japanese singer, and I wrote these songs. And I wrote lyrics. It was the first time I wrote lyrics. And they came out really good. So it's another challenge that I have yeah. in front of me to write these songs with lyrics. The, and like, as you said, it stands a you know, better chance of yeah. something becoming more standard right. material. Well, this has been fascinating for me. Me too. Is there anything that uh, I should have asked you that I that I didn't that you like to add. Mm -mm. add. Mm -mm. No, um, I, I enjoyed this interview because you didn't ask me standard kind of things. You asked me things that gave me a chance to just talk. Right. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. It's